Good morning and welcome to uh, uh, Astronomy 100. Today is September 13th. Today we have, uh, again, like basically most of uh, the weeks, we have a lot of work to do. So let me look quickly into uh, this week. We are in week five, by the way. So uh, we have two units basically to cover, and those are units 34 and 35 from the book. And uh, we have also a homework assignment that is due September 20, uh, 25th, which is a little over 10 days. I mean, almost two weeks, as a matter of fact. So uh, we have to take care of that. Uh, so we don't have a quiz this week. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the units going to also talk about the uh, homework assignment. So those are the things that uh, we're going to be covering today, or at least this week. Okay. Uh, again, uh, let me share with you the screen as a student so that we see what I'm looking at. At some point today, I'm going to try to pull my laptop because the fact that I have a a simulation for the solar system in there. And uh, it's kind of uh, hefty in terms of uh, its computing power. So uh, it needs a big uh, video card. For that, I have it on my laptop. So uh, I'm going to share the screen from there and basically look at the solar system, okay? Look at different objects in the solar system, which is the focus of this week, okay? So uh, let me share first what we have in here in this week. Again, the objectives for this week, let me open them. Uh, these are basically the two main units that we'll be covering this week. And the two units have to do with the, uh, the solar system in general, okay? With a little bit of uh, the focus on how uh, it is structured right now and how it came to be, okay? So this is basically a little bit of a history of the solar system. And how do we know all of these things that we are talking about? How do we know that the solar system, for example, is this old? And, it, uh, and at least we have a theory on how it assembled and how it came to be, OK? And uh, that theory seems to be, uh, in a sense, uh, solid. Let me explain a word in here about theory, because sometimes this is confused with the word opinion. When somebody tells you, I have a theory, usually what they mean is I have an opinion. In science, though, uh, a theory is far more than that. It's not an opinion. As a matter of fact, it's based on a lot of observation, a lot of analysis, and a lot of uh, and the hypothesis. That is, if you wish, the, uh, the, the, uh, the opinion. But that's an educated guess. It's not really an uh, uh, opinion. And then you test that and test it time and again, and then it works. And then you come up with a model, and that model uh, explains what you have observed. Furthermore, it uh, basically predicts all the things that can uh, th that can be explained under the model that were not before part of it. So, in a sense, that it goes into far more than that. And the point being, in here, the body of all of this, namely the experiment, the observation, the analysis, the simulation. Sometimes, a lot of times, we do numerical simulations because of the fact that we have a theory, for example, how the sun, for example, uh, gets its power and energy, and we test it. Of course, in the theory, we only have simple uh, equations, but then we put it on the computer and sure enough, the model fits that. In addition to measurements, in addition to spectroscopy, basically analyzing the lights and so on and so forth. So the collection of all of that knowledge, basically, is what the theory is. So it's not an opinion. It goes way beyond that. So we really have to clarify that point in here. So again, we have a theory, basically, right now at work for the uh, entire solar system, and we're going to work off of that, okay? So chapter 34 talks about the objects in the solar system. And the objects in the solar system, of course, the main one is the sun in terms of its uh, sheer mass and in terms of its sheer size. It represents the vast majority of the solar system itself still, okay? And it's at the center of the solar system. Everything revolves around it. And everything gets, it's basically, uh, it's attached to it gravitationally by the law of gravitation, 
okay? So nothing can escape it, at least in the solar system, okay? Uh, the solar system has planets. We have four inner planets that, have, that are rocky mainly and are characterized by high density, okay? Because they are made basically out of rocks and minerals, and uh, those are higher density than this outer planets. And the outer planets, they are made out of mainly uh, frozen uh, water or methane or helium for the most part, and hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen is the main uh, element in here, followed by helium, followed by the other gases like methane and uh, uh, some of the other basically uh, hydrocarbons, okay? including water, which is really a combination of water, uh, oxygen, and uh, hydrogen. Okay, so hence they have a lower density than this rocky planet. As a matter of fact, the densest of them all is the Earth, followed by Mercury followed by Venus and then uh, actually Venus and uh, Mars are close in terms of their densities. So this is basically the planets, the inner planets in this order from proximity from the sun to uh, the furthest of them, okay? Then comes the outer planets. The outer planets, they start about five astronomical units. As a matter of fact, Mer uh, uh, Jupiter is at 5.2 astronomical units, okay? In other words, it's slightly further than the uh, than the Earth about five times. Okay, slightly more than five times. Okay, five times and a quarter, if you wish, or a fifth. Then followed by Saturn, and then the new two arrivals. I mean, relatively speaking, I mean we discovered them about less than two hundred years ago, namely Uranus and Neptune. Those are the four planets. Okay, this is what we know. Then we have the dwarf planets. The dwarf planets, of course. The oldest one of them all that was known is Pluto, then Eris, in terms of size, Eris is bigger. Of course, we have Sedna. Ceres actually is actually not a, uh, an object in the uh, Kuiper belt. All of these objects, they are what is known as TNOs, meaning they are trans-Neptunian objects. What trans-Neptunian objects are is past Neptune, on the other side of Neptune in the solar system. Remember, Neptune is the furthest planet the solar system. And these objects, they are trans-Neptunian objects. This series is not. Ceres is the dwarf planet that actually exists between Jupiter and Mars. Transition between the inner planets and the outer planets in a, the asteroid belt itself, which has a lot of asteroids, a huge number of asteroids. And Ceres was one of them actually, but it's large enough so that it acquired a spherical shape, sphere, okay? So uh, Haumea, far out and far, far out, and Maki Maki and all of those things, they're just part of the uh, dwarf planets in the uh, uh, TNOs. When we say a trans-Neptunian object, and uh, we say that in a sense that uh, they are past, Neptune is true for all of them. At some point, Pluto gets closer than, than, uh, than uh, Neptune. Okay. which explains uh, how we discovered it, okay? I mean, we were hunting for something else and we discovered it, okay? We thought that it's a planet, but it was not. In the end, it's smaller in size. The fact that it's smaller in size is not a planet, it does not mean that it's not interesting. As a matter of fact, Pluto has more moons than the Earth does, okay? One of its moons, is, it's uh, the ratio of that moon to uh, Pluto itself is, is very big. It's actually bigger than anything that we know, and that's the moon Sharon. Anyway, so those are the main components of the solar system in terms of size. Obviously, in terms of size, Jupiter and Saturn, they dominate, especially Jupiter does, okay, followed by Saturn. So if somebody looking at it from outside of the solar system, the main thing that he or she will notice outside of the sun is Jupiter, maybe Saturn. Everything else that I mentioned up to this point, they're too small to be noticed, including Earth, by the way, okay? I mean, forget about Earth. Uranus and Neptune are much, much bigger than Earth, so including those two anyway, okay? So uh, this is basically how the solar system is, is the main player. Then comes the moons. The moons are actually an interesting, are interesting objects. 
the odd thing is that, um, at least as a general rule is, the inner planets do not have moons. The outer planets have a lot of moons. Mercury and Venus do not have moons at all, zero moons. Mars has two captured moons, Phobos and Deimos. Okay? Those are, we think, they are not actually uh, a part of, uh, they did not form with, uh, with Jupiter, but they were captured later, um, I'm sorry, with Mars, but they were captured later, okay? And those are tiny rocks, extremely small rocks. As a matter of fact, they are of the same size of uh, uh, asteroids, okay? They're too small. Now, Earth though is an exception. For some reason, it has a moon and not a small moon either, it's a big moon. And that is an odd thing that needs explaining. The leading theory right now is that uh, the way our moon formed is actually at early on in the history of the uh, Earth, of course, on the entire system, uh, 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 planets, I mean, there were a lot of objects in the solar system and it, they collided a lot with them. So there was a period of heavy bombardment at that time, a little after that time, a, a Mars-sized object, it's almost the same size of Mars, planet basically, hit Earth, okay? So that collided with it. So that's the, that collision, either it formed in the same orbit of the Earth or it's formed slightly outside of the orbit of the Earth and it was knocked into it or vice versa from the inside and it was dragged into it, one of the two. So this is the models that we have right now. That collision formed this, the, the uh, basically uh, that collision left a lot of debris that formed the ring around the earth for a little while and that ring started to coalesce and form what we know today, the moon. How do we know that? Well, the rocks that were brought from the moon, they have uh, uh, similar structures in a sense, chemi uh, chemical structures to those from the earth. So they, they, they share a common ancestry, especially in terms of radio radioactive dating. There's a, there is a lot of evidence for this one, okay? So this is the moons, okay? Obviously, when we talk about moons, for example, uh, Jupiter has 70 some odd number of moons. The four of them that are known are uh, uh, Callisto, Ganymede, uh, Europa, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Io, okay? Saturn has also a huge number of moons. The biggest one is Titan. Okay, uh, Uranus also has a lot of moons, and so does Neptune. Okay, albeit they are smaller moons, but they have Neptunes. So the moons are actually an interesting object because one of the things when we study the moons in detail, for example, for Jupiter, we will see that they have actually an internal structure that is evidence showing that there is a lot of water, ocean water, salty water. Okay which means it's, it's in liquid form, which could harbor because of the high energies in it, it could harbor, uh, uh, it could harbor uh, basically uh, living organisms in the form that we know. So this is basically the, the up to this point, the moons. Then we have the asteroids. We have two basic structures, okay? The inner uh, uh, ones, which are called the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and this is where Ceres actually exists. And then we have the Kuiper belt, which is also a bunch of asteroids mainly made out of a different structure than the inner ones because of the fact that they form outside. There is a, there is a line which is just around Jupiter where anything outside has a different chemical structure than anything inside. And I mentioned the fact that this outer planets, they have a different uh, chemical structure than this ones. So the same thing with the Kuiper belt, okay? It has a lot of objects and all of these objects, Pluto, Eris, Sedna, and uh, Maki, Maki, Haumea, all of them, they are actually in the Kuiper Belt. And there are far more objects in there than, than you can count. All of these objects up to this point, they form on the so-called ecliptic plane. They form on, they, they follow with unit 35, how the solar system forms, okay? Namely, they are on the same plane. You put the sun in the center and whichever way direction you go, that is actually the objects. You go outside and the influence of the force of gravity from the sun diminishes a little. And at that point, that planar structure is lost and we enter in a zone that is called the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is really made out of a lot of debris left over from the formation of the solar system. 
And that one actually doesn't not necessarily sit on the plane. As a matter of fact, it's gonna spread throughout the big sphere. Okay. And that is a very, very far away region. Okay. It's extremely far. Cannot really believe how far it is. Planet nine, the hypothetical planet nine, to explain some of the oddities in the solar system, that is not in the in that far. Okay, so it's it's actually in, it's still in the region of the uh, where these objects are, namely the Kuiper belt. So this is basically where the object is. Part of the things that exist there in the Kuiper belt itself are the comets. Comets they come from very far away. They come closer to the sun. They heat up, they develop a tail, and then on the way out, they cool down and they lose the tail and they become a rocky structure, basically not rocks, basically uh, ice, frozen ice, and then they continue their journey freezing and then come back again and heat up and so on and so forth. So this is the structure of the solar system. These are the objects in the solar system. Okay, uh, the paths follow Kepler's laws. And the density plays a critical role in here. So when you look at an object and look at its density, it tells you where it was formed. So let me pick up my uh, laptop and see if I can uh, share with you the screen. So let me stop sharing this one in here and let me See if I can share with you. Let me first of all pull it up because it's it's really it makes this even the laptop uh, warm. I have it on my desktop, but it's really not. Uh, if I do it on the desktop, the desktop starts to make this humming noise and uh, slows down everything in here. So I'm going to share with you the simulation that I have, and if you have. Uh, a gaming laptop or a gaming computer, it's actually a good thing to have because it has a lot of physics in it, among other things. It has the solar system. So let me stop it right now in here and let me share with you the screen from the laptop. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at the laptop, okay? Somebody says something in the chat in here? Oh, yes, I got it. So share. Okay, so this is in a sense, the solar system, okay? This is a, uh, the simulation is called, the, the software is called Universe Sandbox, if you're familiar with it. The Universe Sandbox 2.0, it's a really very nice software to have. It's not that expensive, but it's good actually to have. Anyway, so we have in here, as I said before, the sun, which is the main player in the solar system. So if you come up close to it, it really is an amazing sight to see. It has, the main composition of the sun uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, of course, uh, hydrogen and uh, with almost 75% hydrogen and 25% uh, helium. This is the main composition of the sun, okay? And because it is really, it has formed immediately, uh, it was formed in the center of this cloud that as it started to cool down, no, not starts to cool down, it starts to speed up due to the fact that you have the force of a gravity starts to form, to, 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 to coalesce matter together. So it's to pull matter until they collide and they freeze. So now you have a matter that is coming down. You lose, in this case, kinetic energy and converting it into potential energy because the closer you get, remember the potential energy is inversely proportional with the distance. So the closer you are, the higher the potential energy in this case. So in this case, uh, it's actually is going to heat up because it's getting closer and closer. So again, we did this when we looked at Kepler's laws. I probably have stated, I have stated it not correctly. Anyway, so an object far away moves slower. Object closer, it has to move faster. So in other words, it's going to uh, gain put kinetic energy in here in the expense of the uh, potential, it's true. The potential energy is proportional and virtually proportional to the distance, but it's a negative number. So it's actually it diminishes in here, hence the kinetic energy will increase. So it gets you closer, so it has to move faster and faster, just like the rubber duck. If you play with the rubber duck when you're when you're uh, when you're in the bathtub, you will so see it when it gets closer and closer to where the uh, sink is, it's going to move faster and farther away, it's going to move slower. So as it moves faster and faster, 
it heats up. That's what uh, temperature is. It has to do with how fast objects move. So in this case, it heats up. So there is actually an increase in temperature, but now matter is getting closer and closer. And that's how the sun formed. At some point, it gets so hot. It reached temperatures in the tens of millions of degrees because of this process. And if there is high enough pressure, and there is high enough pressure, because a lot of materials now get closer together, that is now you're talking about the size of a sun, amount of matter. At that point, those are the conditions for nuclear reactions. The sun went nuclear, and in doing so, basically, it 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 uh, it, uh, it ejected a lot of because now we have radiation going in every which way direction. So it pushed most of the materials that was kept forming the other objects in the solar system. In other words, when the, 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 the matter, the debris in the nebula was starting to come closer and closer, other planets also, including Jupiter, started immediately after the sun. So Jupiter also was getting bigger and bigger. Then after that, Saturn actually starts to form and so on and so forth. If you look at it this way, the sooner you start in getting materials in, the bigger you become. So at that point, once the sun went nuclear, it starved the rest of the other planets from gaining more materials and going through the same process. Okay, so that's why Jupiter did not go nuclear because the sun did earlier. Okay, had the sun did not go also nuclear at that point, probably Jupiter would have gone into a sun, although in another uh, star although it's going to be extremely less massive and it probably is going to be a lot dimmer than the sun, but it nonetheless is going to be a star, but it did not. So that is how the process the solar system formed. At that point, this is where the sun is. It had remnants of other uh, uh, materials, especially the higher element, lithium and so on and so forth. But for the main part, it is what it is. It's hydrogen and helium with the helium and the hydrogen from what to ever form the solar system from before, which is most likely supernova that exists before in here, because of the fact if you look at different pl planets, for example, uh, oops, I'm using the wrong mouse in the wrong computer. If I look, for example, at Mercury, which is this object in here, and zoom on it. This is where Mercury is. Mercury is actually made out of minerals for the most part, and it's the closest object to the solar system. And uh, it has a high temperature uh, because of the fact uh, because of the fact it's very close from it does not also have an atmosphere that we know of. If you can see the structure itself, it has all of this uh, craters in it, and that is because whatever stripped it from its atmosphere it did it early if it did have an atmosphere. And uh, the structure and it, it looks like it's mainly all of those heavy bombardments that the entire solar system went through. And if you compare, for example, the surface of uh, Mercury to that of the moon, you will see a lot of similarities between them. And that is because of this fact that uh, there, there was actually a heavy bombardment. Why don't we see that on Earth or Venus or Mars for that matter? Or at least a lot in Mars. We see some of it on Mars, but not as much. Uh, there is actually there is on all of this object, but the fact that they had atmosphere, first of all, it dimmed a lot of these collisions. Small ones get uh, gets pulverized before they hit the ground, and uh, also because of the weathering, because of the different activity, uh, geological activities on all of these objects. Okay, so that is basically the difference. Other than that, they all went through the same process. Okay, so this is our first object in here, which is closer. To the sun, let me find the next object, which is Venus. I'm zooming out, by the way, okay? And there is a delay on my computer. Now I'm zoomed out. Okay, Venus is arri arriving, so let me click on it, the horizon, so that I can zoom on it. You can't see much on Venus because of the fact that it has an extremely heavy atmosphere. Okay, as a matter of fact, it's uh, its atmosphere is about uh, the pressure on Venus is about 90 times or 100 times to be more, 
And then uh, if I do a rounding, it's about 100 times that of the Earth because of the extreme carbon dioxide and uh, sulfuric acid and all kinds of uh, uh, stuff that is in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, there is no H2O, there is no water, basically, uh, much of it, if it did exist, and there was, at least according to some uh, recent studies, uh, oceans actually on the planet, but because of the extreme temperatures, whatever water there was in there, it got broken down into its chemical components, namely hydrogen and oxygen, and because the hydrogen is extremely light, it must have rose to the higher atmosphere, and the oxygen, which is now combined with the carbon and to form carbon dioxide and other, uh, basically, structures, so uh, and now hydrogen must have escaped because of the low uh, 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 mass. So and because of its high, uh, the high temperature, so it gains a lot of kinetic energy. It rises to the upper atmosphere, and then it escapes the entire planet. So that's how basically Venus lost its 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 uh, water, and Venus now is really really hellish place on in the solar system because of the extreme high temperatures. One of the things that we mentioned in the past is Venus spins backward and uh, the sun rises in the uh, uh, west and sets in the east back onto <laughs> unlike anything in the solar system. Okay, so this is Venus in here. So let me zoom out. Yeah, I can look at both screens. And see. So now we have to find Earth. Earth, of course, is a familiar object. And one of the odd things about Earth is the fact that it has, uh, here is the Earth. And as you can clearly see, and I'm going to zoom out a little later to see, it's really a jewel in the solar system. It has the right conditions for the water to be in the liquid form. Okay, and uh, you can clearly see it has the upper, the, the caps on the top and the north, the north and the south, which are uh, ripe for the formation basically of the, uh, the ice in the, the ice formations in there. And it has moderate temperatures, it has all kinds of nice features in it to allow for the life to evolve as we know it today. So this is Venus, of course, I'm looking at daytime, I mean nighttime in North America right now because of the, uh, I mean, I can speed up the time and you can see the earth spin, but I really want to freeze it so that we can see, we can talk about all of these objects. Now, let me zoom out. We're gonna talk about the earth in terms of its position in the solar system later on. It really, really is important. A lot of the things that we know about the solar system, we learn them actually in terms of what we know about the earth. Next comes, in terms of planets, of course, comes Mars. Let me find where Mars is. It may be on the opposite side in here. It's the orbit is showing now. And as I am panning in here like this, you can clearly see the ecliptic plane where all of these objects are. So here is Mars. Let me zoom on it. And I came in from the dark side, so let me go and move into the daytime so that we see the main features of it okay so this is mars again it has this hazy structure that looks uh, uh, and it has one of the features is actually this this uh, this this big canyon which is extremely large you cannot even compare it to the grand canyon i mean grand canyon is extremely tiny compared to it it has uh, this mountain in the north uh, northern hemisphere of the planet which is uh, Olympus Mount, which is a huge, probably the biggest mountain. Its area itself is the size of France. I mean, much larger than Missouri. So much larger than a lot of states that we have in here. So it's extremely large. And if you are going to climb the mountain, you wouldn't notice that you're going on a mountain that is extremely high, much higher than the Himalayas because of this large area. So the, the angle in here with which you're climbing is extremely small. Mars is an interesting planet because it's just right outside of the uh, of the Goldilocks uh, zone, basically for the life conditions to be uh, correct, and it's been heavily explored. Mars is small though compared to all of the other uh, uh, compared to the Earth and Venus, and it did not retain its atmosphere. It must have had an atmosphere in the past, and. Uh, it must have also had also water running water because there is all kinds of proof for it. And uh, we have been exploring it extensively. The latest exploration is perseverance and also ingenuity, which is an, uh, 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 a drone 
flying on Mars, and this is for the first time we have such an, such an achievement. And this opened up a new era of space exploration nowadays that we're uh, looking at objects instead of having rovers basically move on the planet or objects, we will have actually flying objects to map them. This has prompted, and it's still in continuing success. There was a lot of doubt about ingenuity, whether or not it's going to fly over Mars or not. And it did, not only once, but several times. I think they have like, I don't think they exactly know, but at least they have about a dozen flights so far, and they're extremely successful, and it flew over a lot of areas. So this now has opened up the window for new explorations in the future. One of the things that uh, Perseverance is actually doing nowadays is actually collecting sample, rock samples from Mars. And we hope to bring it back to Earth so that we study the structure of Mars and see what we know about it in its past and so on and so forth. The plan is in 2027, I think, we're going back to send another mission to go and collect those rocks. And the mission initially was going to go on a rover where we are going to send a rover, land on Mars, and then go and collect them, put them in a capsule and send the capsule to orbit where we're going to collect it again and bring it back to Earth. Now, they're thinking actually instead of doing a rover, we're going to have actually another, uh, another uh, drone instead to pick up a night, pick up a night much faster and then fly back to orbit. So that is because of the success of the drone, the Ingenuity drone. The Chinese now are actually considering a different approach since flying is possible. And they had actually in the past a, a plan to do something similar with the Ingenuity, and that is to have some sort of a aircraft, if you wish, I mean, like a, like blades, like the one that uh, drone operate, a drone basically format. But now they're actually going to have a fixed wings, that's the plan. Fixed wing plane actually to travel over 700 kilometers at once. So that's a very, very ambitious pro uh, 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 program that hopefully succeeds and teaches us more about the planet. Uh, NASA also is planning another uh, uh, similar mission actually for Titan, the moon of, uh, of uh, Saturn, to also have uh, for drones in there. And because the atmosphere is much, much thicker on Titan than on, uh, on Venus, we think that's going to be actually much, much easier to fly over and to give us a much more uh, detailed uh, structure of Titan. So you see, now we are entering a new era in astronomy, and that is where uh, 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 rovers basically having objects move on the surface is not the only way of, uh, of exploring uh, 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 planets and moons in the future, and that is to actually have objects to fly in. Where did we learn all of this? From the last mission in February 18th that, was, uh, that landed in there on Mars. So this is amazing stuff and this is new stuff, okay? It's really, uh, it's all kinds of papers and research and talk about it now that people are publishing. And I'm glad that you guys are actually on the cutting edge of these things. So again, this is Mars. This is the, uh, the fourth object in the solar system from the, uh, the inner planets. And this is ends the last object in the inner planets. Let me zoom out and see if I can find where Jupiter is. Before I find Jupiter, I'm going to actually zoom out to a point. Of course, the sun is in here. Now we're going to see, let me zoom out, see other objects. This is Ceres, the one that I was talking about. This is an important object, which is a dwarf planet. And you can clearly see the structure it has this spherical shape. Okay, Vesta, which is also another interesting uh, dwarf uh, 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 asteroid is in here also, which is uh, another object. So there are a lot of interesting objects past Mars before Jupiter. So let me zoom in into, oops, I'm going to double click on Ceres because it's an important object and we're now sending it actually missions to it too. So that's one of the things that we're planning to go to. And that is Ceres, which is actually dwarf planet not too far from here. There's some interesting structures in here too that we're trying to understand, including this, what looks like it's either minerals or icy structures on it. So could it be that it's also a subsurface also has a lot of water in it and that could also harbor some sort of life and this is not too far. This is actually not getting to Jupiter yet so this is not very far object. And then let me come and zoom out. Why is it zoom again? Try to zoom out okay. Okay, we're zooming out now. So now we're getting into Jupiter, the big 
player in the solar system. By the time we're in Jupiter, look at the object. As a matter of fact, we zoomed out so far that we can see even uh, Uranus. And uh, so where is Saturn? Saturn is somewhere in here. This is the path of Saturn, so we can find it. Uh, but let me zoom quickly on uh, Jupiter, not just it's not because it's not an important object, but just because we really are running out of time. So this is Jupiter. Let me look at it from the bright side. Again, I'm going to rotate the uh, planet. In the background, you see the, the, the Milky Way. So this is the structure of Jupiter. It has a lot of basically structure and a lot of things. If you look at it with a telescope, you're not going to see much more details than this. So this is uh, Jupiter again. And uh, it has all of this, what looks like it's a layered structure because of the different winds that are uh, happening on it. So it's, it has, it's a very windy uh, planet and it's a big planet. It's the biggest planet there is. And it has its, its five moons. At this point, let me zoom out because I'm not really, uh, we're gonna get into more details about these planets and all of them. Okay, so let me find where Saturn is with its famous wings, all, I mean, famous rings. So Jupiter also has rings, okay? Here is Saturn. Look at the inner planets. Where is now Mercury? Where is Earth? They are actually very much closer to the sun. So at this point, if I look at Saturn and uh, uh, zoom on it, you probably are not gonna see a lot of details because this is how actually it's going to look like. The rings are so, so thin, you're not gonna be able to see them. I mean, if you have the proper angle with the telescope, you're gonna see more details than this, okay? But this is Saturn, which is the second largest object in the solar system in terms of planets and other objects, other than, of course, the sun. This, in terms of the sun, it's actually the third one. Saturn has this peculiar property that it's less dense than water, meaning if you take Saturn and put it in an ocean big enough to contain it, it's going to float. It's not going to sink. It says very low density. Jupiter, by the way, the density is slightly more than one gram per cubic meter uh, because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, Again, it's slightly basically higher than water. Okay, let me zoom out again. Let me go into uh, Uranus and then Neptune. Once you see one of these two there, the other one is similar. And that is because of the methane on their surface, they appear bluish in color. One of them more so than the other, but they, are, they are look similar, okay? So let me try to spin it a little bit, go to the other side so that we can see it. We put the sun behind us and look at it, okay? has this greenish, bluish color because of the methane on its surface. Again, Neptune is just outside of it. And this is basically all of the planets. Let me find Neptune because that's actually the, the, the last object that we usually refer to. After that, we refer to the TNOs. And where is, here is Neptune, okay? After Neptune, Again, it has this bluish color if you look at it in the bottom in here. Uh, comes the, uh, the objects that are outside of the solar system. I mean, outside of uh, Neptune, I'm sorry, they're still in the solar system. Look at the size. First of all, look at uh, where uh, uh, Pluto is. Pluto has this eccentric path in here. You can see the path. I turned on the path so that you can see it. And at sometimes it goes just inside of Neptune, although it's called a TNO also, a trans-Neptunian object. You have Quoar, I think that's how they call it, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then you have also Sedna and you have Eris. This is Eris. This is the biggest player in terms of all those objects. So all of this are dwarf planets and they are actually not the entire picture in the solar system. We still have more objects. Look how eccentric Sedna is in terms of its path. At some point it goes very far away. At this point, at this distance, from the solar system, you cannot see it. Right now, we are fortunate enough that it's close enough to us to see, but at some point going to be extremely, extremely far. And look at how the eccentric the path is. Again, this is unit 35 and 34, uh, uh, and the 35 talks more about the paths and things like that, so, and how the solar system formed and so on and so forth, okay? So at this point, we're still actually in the solar system, albeit all, everything is really still inside. I mean, it looks inside because the sun's influence is, is very far away. 
And that is true for all of the planets, by the way, uh, for all the uh, stars, by the way. And even then, at this point, the, the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, cannot be seen. So if you're at Proxima Centauri, the only thing that you're going to probably see is the sun, unless you have powerful techniques to look inside and see other objects, especially Jupiter, maybe Saturn, if you're lucky enough. Okay. So this is the solar system. Let me zoom into uh, Pluto. And look at how look at it up close because this is one of the things that fascinated people a lot. Let me look at it from the other side, the lit side. It's a dark place because of the fact that this tries to simulate the real thing, okay? Because it's very far away from the sun still, okay? This is how Pluto would look like. And again, it's a dwarf planet, not a planet. But it's still a planet nonetheless, even though dwarf. Let me stop sharing this screen in here. And let me move to the other computer. I may have to close the program. Do I need to close it? Yes, I need to close it because otherwise I have to. This computer is extremely hard. So let me continue with the discovery in this units. Let me share with you the screen. How do we know how old the solar system is and what it's made up of? One of the techniques we use is the so-called calorimetry. Basically, you have radioactivity, a material, like for example, the example I have in here is for potassium-40. If you look at the periodic table, potassium-40, is one of the elements in the in the first line, okay? That has a valence of one, meaning it has one electron it can interact outside. The other electrons, they are all tied up inside the atom itself. So the way you have it in here, it has 19 protons, okay? Meaning it has, when it's neutral, 19 electrons. So uh, that means 18 electrons, they are closely bound to the nucleus and one electron that can basically interact in chemical reaction, can bound and form different structures and so on and so forth, like oxides, whatever you want to form it in. Now, it has one of the two ways that it can go, because naturally, it's not really a stable element itself. This isotope 40, that means it has 19 protons and 21 neutrons. 21 plus 19 is exactly 40. 40 protons and neutrons, that's what that number says. Now, one of the two things could happen. 90% of the times or 89% of the times you're picking the exact number, actually it's slightly less than that. 89% of the times, which is the vast majority of the times, it releases an electron, okay? One of this neutrons, the 21 neutrons in it, changes into a proton and changes the number from 19 to 20, and red gets rid of an electron. This is so-called beta minus decay. This is the natural decay. What is this bar in here? That is just to make the thing work in terms of the energy and in terms also of the charge and in terms of the number of electrons. This is called the neutrino or antineutrino to be more specific, okay? So this is a nuclear reaction as a matter of fact, and it's a decay. Because what happened in here, I had potassium changing into calcium because the number of protons changed from 19 to 20. So the chemical properties have changed completely. When calcium is neutral, it has two electrons that can participate in different processes, okay? So different chemical properties, different structure, different all kinds of things, okay? Calcium is what is in your bones and all of that. So that is one nuclear reaction. The other nuclear reaction for the same element, potassium uh, 40, again, is actually, it captures an electron. And one of these protons changes and becomes a neutron. So instead of having 21 neutrons, we now have uh, 22 neutrons because one of those protons became a neutron. And then the protons, of course, uh, that we had 19, because one of them captured an electron and became a neutron. 
So now we only have 18. It's still a different uh, element now. This is an argon. The argon is a neutral uh, uh, gas. It's a noble gas. It doesn't enter in any chemical reaction. So this is neutral. But this only happens about 11% of the times. So most of the times, you have the release of an electron and the element calcium. Sometimes, 11% of the times, you actually capture an electron and then you change it into an argon. Now, here is how the process works. If I take a sample, a rock, okay, and measure how much calcium I have, because this takes so many billions of years to happen and so on and so forth, this one. So if I can find how much I have calcium versus how much I have uh, potassium, and if I have how much argon versus how much I have potassium, I can tell the age of that one, just of the ratios, because this is, happens at the regular rate. So this is the process how we determine uh, uh, dating, similar to carbon dating, when we compare carbon 14 to carbon 12 and uh, carbon, uh, yeah. And, in a, in a sample, a living organism, but that's only in the thousands of years. So it's not useful for long range dates, okay? So this is one of the techniques. Again, I mentioned the nebula theory and how the solar system structure uh, came, came about to be. And then of course, uh, the, the, uh, the different heavy elements. Now, if you look at, for example, at cut, 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 cut into the earth, you will see the, the more dense minerals, especially iron and nickel, they, 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 they go down because of a gravity. Like for example, when you take and shake a, a sample of rocks and one of them are denser, the, the denser ones go in the middle and the lighter ones go into the outside. And that is because of the effects of gravity. Again, this is the concepts that we have covered, that we're planning to cover this week. I hope that you guys will read through this two units, okay, both of them and then come to the homework. Let me talk a little bit about the homework because it's important and uh, how we're going to solve this homework, okay? The homework is actually from the previous week. The assignment is from the previous week, not from this one. If you have the book, these are the problems right now. Either edition, it's the same page, the same problems. If you don't have the book, here are the problems, okay? So I don't think that should be an excuse now if you don't have the book. So let me stop sharing and I'm going to go through each and every one of these problems. Let me stop sharing the, the uh, this screen. I'm gonna share with you another screen. Let me prepare it first of all. Let me add a note in here. This is week five and how these problems look like. Okay, so let me stop sharing and share now this screen. Let me pull the page to the other side. So they can read the problems with you guys. And hopefully you guys have by now at least canvas open to this page and you should be able to see the problems. And I'm not gonna solve them in detail, but I'm going to rely on you to finish the calculations. And if you have any questions, please let me know, okay? I'm gonna talk briefly about each and every one of those problems. Uh, so problem 10, problem 10, it's a series, has a period P, equals to 4.6, zero years. When I write four, six, zero, regardless of this decimal point in here, and it's actually because of the decimal point in here, uh, this number is important. This number is important. And this number is important. We call them usually in the jargon that is used on a day-to-day -day business, significant, significant 
figures. Sometimes you, write, you see people refer to them or talk to them as sig figs, significant figures, okay, sig fig. How many sig figs do you have? I have three sig figs. I have three of them. That means that's all I can tell. I, can, I, I don't have four, so I cannot invent a new sig fig than this. Okay, now this is a, a part of the question. What is its semi-major axis? Where in the solar system does this play series? Okay, we saw it, it's between Mars and Jupiter. Mars is slightly uh, 1.52. So Mars is 1.52 AU and uh, Jupiter, is 5.20 AU, okay? We saw it between these two numbers. We saw it actually in the simulation earlier between Mars and Jupiter. So the answer A should be between 1.52 and 5.2, should be between these two numbers. So let's find A. We know that P squared is equal to A cubed, okay? P squared is given. 4.60. So all I have to do is multiply 4.6 times 4.6 and equate that to a cubed. Okay. From there, we should be able to find a because a should be the cubic root of, uh, of uh, this number, whatever this number is. So I pick up a calculator and hopefully you guys do. And I multiply 4.60 times 4.60. My calculator is telling me it's 21.16. So let me write it down. My calculator is telling me that this is 21.16. Okay, that's what the calculator has told me. But that is not true. That is wrong. I mean, the calculator gave me a number according to its best abilities is this one. But I have to make a decision because the calculator is not correct. Okay, calculator is is making an assumption that I'm, I know this in numbers but with an infinite number of accuracy, and I don't. I know them only with three sig figs. So in other words, I have to only retain three sig figs. These are the numbers I should retain up to here. Those are the three sig figs. I count one, two, and three, OK? It doesn't matter where the decimal point sits as long as I have three, OK? But now I have to ask a question. Is this number five? or more? Obviously, the answer it is five or more, yes, because it's six. Six is more than five. As long as it's five or more, we're good. If it is five or more, we have to change it. We have to uh, 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 round it up and make it add one in here. No matter what you have in here, add one to it. And that's it. Now you're in good shape. So the answer should be, instead of one in here, I add to it one, it becomes a two. And instead this, I don't change them because there is nothing to carry or anything like that. So this 21.2. So this is A cubed. So that's why I'm saying it's three sig figs. I still have three sig figs, by the way, in here. So I'm in good shape, three sig figs. Because I started with three significant figures, I cannot make up a fourth one. That's the problem. We cannot come up and say it's 2116. The best I can say in this case is 21.2. Let me find the cubic root. Now, if I do the cubic root, I really have to use a calculator. I don't know. In other words, what is the number? If I multiply it three times by itself, I get 21.1. It could be one or more than one, because I know one times one times one is one. And 21.1 .1 is more than one. So it's more than one. It could be two or more. Two times two times two is eight. And eight is less than 21.2. So the number must be more than two. Because if I cube two, I get eight. And this number is definitely more than eight. How about 
if I multiply three times three times three, again, you don't need to do this, but just to give you an idea of where the number needs to sit. Now, three times three times three is, a, is, is three times three is a nine times three is actually 27. 27 is more than this number. So the answer is between two and three. Obviously, the answer is, it could be 2.1, it could be 2.2, it could be 2.9, but it must be more than two and it must be less than three. Since it's more than two and less than three, it has to be more than two astronomical units. So it's outside on the other side of uh, Mars because Mars is 1.52 and this is more than two. So it has to be past Mars because Mars is one and a half times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Let me draw this picture here so that we can see it again. Okay, here is the Sun. Here is Mercury, which is 0.4 or 0.38. Here is uh, Venus, which is 0.7. And here is the Earth, which is one exactly. Then Mars is here, 1.5, 1.52, okay, if you want to uh, really qualify. And then here, there is Jupiter. So you have the, uh, I mean, uh, Mercury, you have Venus, you have Earth, you have Mars, and you have Jupiter, okay? This is more than two. It's more, this is where two is. It's more than two, but less than three. Three is less than five. So this is where Ceres is somewhere in this number. Now I can use a calculator and find exactly what this number is. So if I have access to a calculator, all I have to do is plug in the number and say the cubic root of, what is it, 21.2? Uh, when I do the cubic root to it using the calculator, it should give me a number that is between two and three. And sure enough, it's 2.7. <laughs> Let me write what my calculator is giving me. 2.767655007288 Obviously, all of this is nonsense. I have to only retain three numbers of it, the significant figures again. I have to retain this number. I have to retain this number and I have to retain this number. But ask, is this number five or more? It is. It's a seven. I don't care about all of this, who cares? They're irrelevant. This is the only one that you have to ask yourself about. The one next in your significant. Is this more than seven? I mean, more than or equal to five? That's the question you ask for me. Since it's a seven and it's more than five, I have to add one in here. That's it. That's how I round up. So when I add one to this number, it's gonna be a seven. This does not change then because I don't have to carry anything. So it stays seven. And the answer is this. So it's actually closer to the three than to the, uh, to the two. It's actually here somewhere. But it's still where I thought it need to be. The point is the answer to this one, it's still between Mars and Jupiter in the so-called asteroid belt. As we saw it in the simulation, it's correct. How did we know this? using this Kepler's third law. <clears throat> Let me take another of this problem. I did it in detail, this one, and I did it in purpose in detail so that you guys are at ease with the rounding thing because some of you probably are not too familiar with it. They didn't take enough math of it and it might be confusing a little bit. So hopefully with the more practice, you're going to, to have it. But the only thing I did is actually use this one. I squared the period since they gave me the period of uh, 4.6 years. And then uh, I took the cubic root, that's all I did. All of these things in here I did, you don't really have to do, but it gives you actually an idea what the answer need to be again. <laughs> gives you an idea where the answer need to be. So sometimes it's a good idea to do this, but you don't have to, okay? 
can just plug in the number under the, uh, the calculator and you're done with it and you answer. Now, the, since the answer is between more than that of Mars, but less than that of Jupiter, I know it's somewhere in here because the answer is 2.77. 2.77 is clearly more than 1.52 and less than 5.2. So that means it's between Mars and Jupiter. And that's exactly how, what we saw earlier when we looked at the uh, animation. Okay, so that's 10. Let's look quickly at 11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, let me look at the uh, questions. Sedna, an object in the outer system, solar system, has a semi-major axis of 526 astronomical. What is the orbital period? How does this compare to Pluto's orbital period of 248.1 years? Okay, they gave you, you'll find it, it's a ridiculous number, okay? Uh, they gave you the period, uh, they gave you the A for Sedna. Sedna, not Sedan. Okay, Sedna, okay? They tell you A is equal to 526 astronomical units. Again, I have three sig figs. It doesn't matter if I have a decimal point or no decimal point. They gave me three significant figures. So the answer for P, I have to be careful to. So I have to find P equals to A cubed. Since they gave me A, all I have to do is multiply five times 26 times 526 times 526. This is gonna be a ridiculous number. Okay, gonna be a very large number. Let me tell you what my calculator is telling me: five twenty-six times five twenty-six times five twenty-six. It has one hundred forty-five million five hundred and thirty-one thousand five hundred seventy-six. Okay, so all of this. I have to now take its square root, okay? Because P, this is P squared, not P. So it's gonna be 12,000 years or something. 12,000 years compared to 400, uh, 248 is ridiculously large. Here is the, what I was saying when I was showing this, uh, the animation. Right now it's close from the solar system. 12,000 years ago, that's even before Moses, okay? <laughs> what, 5,000 years ago? Or the pharaohs, 5,000 years ago? 5,000 years ago, the pharaohs would not have seen Sedna the way it is now. The Ice Age, what, 12,000 years ago or something? That is probably the, the first humans when they crossed to Europe, that is probably not too far from that. So it's a really ancient history when the last time Sedna in its current, 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 uh, current position. So, uh, if you wait 6,000 years from today, Sedna will not be even visible. I mean, it will be very, you cannot look at it. You have to have an extremely powerful telescope to see it. Just to show you, right now it has a very eccentric path, of course. It's going very far away and then comes back. Okay, So right now it's actually uh, reachable. You can see it because it's closer. But that's how uh, things are. Compared to 240, uh, again, if you look at Pluto, Pluto is 240, what was the question again? 248, 250 years ago, roughly, okay? So right now we're in the year 2021, okay? Uh, 250 years ago puts us in uh, the 18th century, 1820 to be more specific. Subtract from it another 50 years, that's the 1750. Okay, so we are still in the wide west in here in this country, 17, not 1770, okay? So barely America is getting together and a civil war and all of these things going on. So that's when Pluto is, was what it is right now. So that's Pluto, but this is ridiculous. Sedna is ridiculous compared to uh, Pluto, okay? Huge number. Uh, so this is question 11. Question 12, suppose an asteroid is discovered with an orbit that brings it 0.5 AU from the sun and as far as 5.5 AU from, uh, from it. What is the semi-major axis orbit? What is its period? period? So let's look at 12 because 12 is interesting. Okay, here is the story for 12. So you have the sun in here. 
at some point, this asteroid is going to be very close, 0.5 AU. Almost, I mean, it's actually going to be slightly closer to, this is where uh, Mercury is. So it's gonna be very close from Mercury. Uh, the other one, Venus, is going to be here. <clears throat> Venus is 0.7. So this is going to be very close from Mercury, this asteroid. And some other times it's going to be 5.5. Uh, .5. Remember, this is where Jupiter is, 5.2. This is going to be slightly further than Jupiter, 5.5. .5. So this is the path of this asteroid. Very eccentric. The sun is here, very eccentric. The semi-major axis, the semi-major axis is actually half this distance. So what I do for this problem, I take 5.5, which is this distance, this distance, 5.5, and add to it this uh, distance of 0.5, it's gonna give me six AU, divide that by two. That is how A is. So A is three AU. Again, use the formula to find what P squared is. So P squared is going to be AU cubed and AU is three times three times three, which is 27, okay? So when you take the square root of 27, that is, basically what the number is. It's gonna be slightly more than five years, okay? So that is problem 12. Problem 13, if a comet orbits the sun and reaches one AU at its closest approach to the sun and its orbital period is 27 years, what is its maximum distance from the sun? This problem is actually slightly different. So I'm hoping that you guys will, uh, will, uh, will take care of this problem. So I'm talking about problem 13 now. So problem 13, What it says in here, you have, this is where a comet is. So this is the sun again. At some point, it's exactly as far as from the earth. So it's one AU from the earth. And at some other time, I don't know X, which we need to find. But they tell us that it's uh, period P is equal to, tw uh, to uh, 27 years. So it's 27 years, that means 27 squared, that's P squared, must be equal to A cubed, A cubed. So now I have to do the calculator and take 27 times 27 and take its cubic root. So again, A is going to be the cubic root of 27 squared, which is 27 times 27, which is the number between 700 and 900, about 800 and something, okay? But when you take its cubic root, you're going to find the answer for A. Once you find the answer for A, you double this number. So let's do this one because it's kind of a multi-step problem and I really don't want you to get lost with it. So let's find the cubic root first of all. all right, let's be accurate in here. So we're going to find 27 times 27. And the whole thing, I'm going to take the cubic root in it. So you really need the calculator that has a cubic root in it. And if you don't have one, please let me know so that we can see how we can do this one. Okay. So, oh, this one is 9. 9 AU. Okay, according to the calculator. That's fast enough. Hmm. 3 times 3 times. I'm trying to check it, okay? If I take the cubic root, yeah, it's nine, it's correct. Okay, that's good, okay. <laughs> so it's nine, that's easy. Once you find that, you double this one, it becomes 18 and 18 is subtract from it one, that should be 17. So the correct answer is 17 astronomical units. If you don't understand this one or if you need help with it, please let me know, we'll work it out together and let's make sure that you guys have no question that this is easy for you guys, okay? The last question from the homework set that we need to talk about is calculate the speed in kilometers per second of an asteroid in an orbital, an orbit of, uh, of four AU by dividing the orbit circumference by its period. Okay. 
So for this one, we have to find the speed. 14. So it has a circular orbit like this, not not a not a not an elliptical orbit. Okay, so it has the radius, circular orbit at, at four AU by the binding. Okay, so we have the radius r. Okay, the circumference is going to be two times r, and r the radius is four astronomical units. So this is going to be two times pi, which is 3.14, times uh, four. So this is a circumference in astronomical units. So AUs. And then I have to find the period. So this is a multi-step problem, by the way. Okay. I have to find the period. The period P squared is equal to A cubed. And A, in this case, is the radius. Okay. So I have to multiply four times four times four, which is 64. That should give me P squared and the square root of 64 is 16. So 16 years, okay? It takes 16 years to do this, this, this circular path. This is not an orbital path, an elliptical path. I remember the ellipse is a special case of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the circle is a special case of the ellipse. In a sense, it's an eccentricity of zero, that's all. That means the two focal points collide on one another, collapse on one another. So in this case, we have the period, we have the circumference of difference travel from here to here, back to here. So in this case, the velocity is going to be circumference divided by period, except now I have to find it in kilometers per second. That's all, that's the problem. So I have two times pi times four astronomical units. One astronomical unit is, 150 million kilometer. Okay. So that is how much 150 million, that's to 10 to the power eight kilometers. So I need to know that the, uh, that one AU is 150 million kilometers. And 150 million kilometer in scientific notation is 1.5 times 10 to the power. I have six plus two zeros in here, so it's uh, 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 eight in here, kilometers. So I have to make the conversion because they want specifically the question in kilometer per second. Divided by 16 years, 16 years, one year has 365 days. Uh, one day has 24 hours. An hour has 60 minutes, a minute has 60 seconds. They want the answer to be in kilometers per second. And that's the only way to get to kilometers per second. And that is to do several conversions. So all you have to do now is multiply two times 3.14 times four times 1.5 times 100 million divided by 16 times 365 divided by 24 divided by 60 divided by 60 again to get the answer in kilometers per second. Okay. So that should give you an answer for these problems. Now, I did them actually for the most part, all of them. Uh, some of them I did not do them in detail, but some of them I want in detail. I hope you guys do them because this is the essence of what we do in science, numbers. Numbers tell far more the story than just the, the models. And actually the models are based on numbers. Everything we say, we talk about is based on numbers. The homework is not supposed to be an exam. It's supposed to be for you guys to help you understand things. That's why I encourage you to work in teams. That's why I encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, ask questions, Google, read the book. And if you have difficulty with it, please let me know. And we should learn a thing or two from them. Sounds good. The main thing is you have to submit your work. You cannot not submit your work. Okay, so I hope that the week is on a good uh, start. There is one thing that I need to mention before we uh, stop recording. And that is the fact that I already uh, reviewed your uh, quiz in terms of how you did it. I gave you some credits because sometimes you get one thing right and another one that is uh, very close from it. So you get partial credit for it. So I gave you partial credit for some of the questions. Sometimes those uh, matching questions, if you don't get them all right, it gives you zero, but you have a lot of them that are right. So you still get partial credits on those. 
And it's basically, as far as the system is concerned, it's all or nothing. But obviously the reason why I credit each assignment for in the assignment more than one is so that I can give you partial credit in it. And that's what happened. And that's what uh, you should have seen in your grade. If you have questions about your grade, please let me know and we will meet on a one to base, one basis and we will be able to resolve whatever issues that you might have or explain exactly the rationale behind the grading system and so on and so forth. Okay, unless you guys have any question, I'm gonna stop the recording and I will see you guys next week. And hopefully for those who are not here, you're gonna be uh, into this one in here. There was no item of discussion today. Okay, so the only thing that you can probably mention is the fact that uh, uh, the fact that you can meet with me on a one to one basis regarding the quiz because it was posted, the grades were posted. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording.